65 million years ago, when the last of the non-avian dinosaurs were winking their way out of existence, some of the first primates saw their origins in the ancient treetops of a shrouded forest. It is in that lonely canopy that we find what may be the first primate listlessly scuttling through the branches. This intro may sound a bit familiar to you, and that's because I'm redoing the wild tale of human evolution, at least to the point that we're currently at. I've got a ton of new equipment, I've finally put foam pads on the walls like a real YouTuber, and I would like that older content to be as accessible as my newer content. I want people to be able to learn about human evolution with Without being turned off by my bad audio and awful editing. Primates are a devastatingly diverse order of mammals characterized by dexterous hands tipped with nails rather than claws, flexible wrists and ankles, prominent clavicles and mobile scapulae, incredible binocular vision, and large brains for their body size. We humans, along with the other apes, monkeys of all stripes, tarsiers, lemurs, lorises, and galagos are the primates of the modern era, and our order is the third most speciose, after Rodentia and Chiroptera. Now, a serious look at human evolution could really begin at any point in time, all the way from now to the last universal common ancestor of all life. We could start with the first eukaryote, the first tetrapod, the first synapsid, but I think starting with the first primate is appropriate, because primates, albeit a bit subjectively, appear to be where things start to look a little familiar. They start to look human. We primates first begin to diversify after the demise of the non-avian dinosaurs, really showing up in the fossil record around 56 million years ago. But according to the molecular clock, we see our order's origins much earlier indeed, 90 million years ago, when fearsome theropods thundered across the landscape. The most ancient primates aren't yet known to the fossil record, but other mammals living at the time thrived in the microcosm of the treetops, emerging to eck out a living in the dead of night. Now, differentiating the primates from the almost primates is a harrowing job indeed, and this is due to the nature of evolution. Daughter species that are in the process of diversifying away from their parent species are essentially indistinguishable from them, at least at first. Unfortunately, and somewhat ironically, this means that the more complete the fossil record grows, the harder it is to demarcate where species begin and end. Although determining the exact moment that primates distinguish themselves from other mammals that are kind of similar to primates is pretty well impossible, we can definitely clock primates once they have for sure appeared on the scene. And because of the nature of evolution, we can understand that the almost primates are probably a good representation of what the very early primates would have looked like. Purgatorius is a plesiodapiform, which is an order that is considered to be a sister group to primates. Purgatorius is found in the famous Hell Creek Formation alongside famous and charismatic dinosaurs, and given it lived 66 to 63 million years ago, it evidently made it through the catastrophic mass extinction event that killed the dinosaurs off. It has been considered for a long time to be a basal or early member of primates due primarily to its mobile ankles, which remember is one of the characteristics of a primate. But as far as far as primate connections, this is all we can really say for Purgatorius. The remains of this rat-sized animal are mostly dental, with some mandibles and postcrania. And when we take a closer look at the teeth, specifically the molars, we can clock some minutiae that ally Purgatorius instead with the plesiodapiforms. Plesiodapus was another candidate for a long time, but the name may give away the order in which this animal currently resides. It lived from 58 to 55 million years ago in both North America and Europe, and this animal is represented by some very nice specimens. It looked a lot like a lemur, but it lacks some of the critical characteristics that modern strepsirines like lemurs have, such as a postorbital bar. It also has a very strange set of teeth for something that was once considered to be a basal primate, with long procumbent incisors and reduced canine teeth. Unlike Purgatorius, whose predators would have been dinosaurs and birds that lived prior to the KPG extinction, Plesiodapus would have had to look out for the earliest carnivores like Prisinictus. Another candidate is Altiatlasius. This animal lived 57 million years ago in what is modern day Morocco, and unlike Plesiodapus, it does appear to have a more typical primate looking dentition. However, some have suggested that Altiatlasius belongs with the Plesiodapiforms, meaning we're still a bit up a creek at 57 million years ago as far 
far as the definitive first primate. By 56 million years ago, we can truly clock some of the first U-primates, or true primates, in the flesh. Well, bone. Cantius is found in Europe and in North America, Don Russellia in Europe, Altanius in Mongolia, and Tylehardina in Europe, North America, and Asia. Of these primates, Cantius and Don Russellia are both strepsirines, they're allied with the lamariforms. Tylehardina falls with the haplorines, the tarsiers and the anthropoids, and Altanius is unranked. So we at least know for sure that by 56 million years ago, primates have arrived, and specifically the ancestors of two big modern groups are thriving. Around this time, many other major mammal groups were getting their start. Phenacodus was the size of an enormous dog and would kick off the hoofed animals. Mesonyx was an early carnivore that would have perhaps looked a bit more familiar to us, resembling a weaselly canine. Indohyus would rapidly adapt to the coasts and eventually yield the cetaceans, and six-foot-tall penguins could be found in Australia, along with 30-foot snakes like Gigantophus thriving in Africa and Asia. All the while, primates kept high above the ground. But why did primates evolve in the first place? What was it about these survivors or the environment they lived in that led them to be one of the most successful and speciose orders over the course of the whole Cenozoic? The arboreal hypothesis was proposed all the way back in 1916 by Frederick Jones. This idea suggested that the traits characteristic of primates emerged because they were advantageous for life in the trees. The idea was that mobile hands and feet, along with excellent depth perception, allowed primates to more efficiently maneuver through the trees. Jones pointed out that most modern primates are arboreal today to bolster his idea. The visual predation hypothesis came around in the 1960s and 70s and challenged this idea. Matt Cartmel noticed that many animals that are superb in the trees lack the characteristics that primates have. Squirrels, for instance, don't have large brains, nails, or binocular vision. However, binocular vision does pop up in predator animals like cats. In conjunction with this observation that many modern insectivorous primates are among the most basal-looking of the extant species, Cartmel proposed that instead primates evolved binocular vision and grasping hands to hunt insects. In support of his idea would be the modern feeding habits, but also also the fossil record, some of the oldest primates are clearly insectivorous. The angiosperm primate coevolution hypothesis was proposed by Robert Sussman in the 1990s. Sussman contested the visual predation hypothesis, arguing that most insectivorous primates hunt using their ears, not their eyes, and don't necessarily even do so in the trees. He instead proposed the idea that primates co-evolved with another freshly diversifying group around the Paleocene, the angiosperm trees, or fruiting plants. The argument was that fruiting bodies grow at the terminal ends of branches, meaning you've got to be good in the trees to reach them. Not only that, but fruits go hand in hand with flowers, which attract pollinating insects. Thus, primates capable of reaching these fruits and flowers were selected for and ended up dispersing the seeds of the angiosperm fruits that they ate, a mutually beneficial relationship. Today, it's generally thought that a combination of the visual predation hypothesis and the angiosperm primate coevolution hypothesis is responsible for the diversity of primates. Since Cartmill's original assertion, the visual predation hypothesis has gained most of its support from neurology. It seems that the early primates had really beefed up their sensory motor function and those specific regions of the brain that are responsible for excellent hand-eye coordination great for catching insects. Similarly, since the 90s, the fossil record for angiosperm plants does seem to support that we see the emergence of primates and a lot of these larger angiosperms around the same time period. In the next episode, we'll discuss the marvelous Eocene and the new forms that primates would take as they began to radiate out into the larger world.